All right, so it's been a while since I've done a q and I'm just gonna jump right into it. Question number one, are your old paintings for sale? Um, I just did a, a Patreon video where I showed a bunch of my early paintings, kind of talked about them. Um, and I've made videos here on YouTube as well where I talk about some of my older paintings. And actually, you know, now that I've held on to them for so long, I've kind of grown attached to them. Uh, so I don't have any plans to sell my old work. But who knows, it could change. If it does, I'll let you guys know here on YouTube. Um, let's see, next question. How do you approach the initial drawing? Um, so when I am starting a drawing for a painting, uh, as you guys know, I sketch in burnt sienna, which I just thin with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. And what I do is I focus on shapes. I'm not looking, I never look for detail. I'm looking at shapes and relationships of things. Oftentimes if I'm plein air painting, I will make sure that whatever um, point of interest, you know, maybe the center of interest or the thing that drew me to the scene, uh, you know, I'll spend time making sure, you know, maybe it's a rock or a tree or something. I'll make sure that I get that into the right position uh, before filling out the rest of the, um, of the uh, sketch. But most of the time I just, I only spend a few minutes on it because usually I try to get, with a viewfinder, I try to get a good idea of what I want to do. And then I just strike a few lines to um, kind of, you know, map out things so that I know where I can start massing in the shapes. So that's kind of how I approach it. Again, looking at shapes. Also too, um, sometimes if I'm trying to match an angle, one trick I do is I'll hold out my brush, I'll match the angle and then I'll move it over to the canvas and then I'll strike my line. So that's, that's one little trick I use. But other than that, yeah, like I said, just trying to get all the shapes in the right place and the relationships in the right, um, yeah, the proper relationships between the shapes and lines. Okay, uh, next question. Do you ever have an allergic reaction when preparing hardboard panels? No, I haven't. Uh, mostly what I do with my hardboard panels, which is like masonite, I cut them up, I give them a sanding, a light sanding, so that uh, sometimes the surface of the hardboard can be kind of shiny, so I'll kind of rough that up so that the gesso will stick to it better. Um, but I wear a dust mask when I'm sanding, and then as I apply the gesso, sometimes I'll give a light sanding in between coats with a sanding sponge, which is like a, it's like a block made out of sponge um, that's got, you know, um, it's got grit attached to it. Um, so I will use a sanding sponge, but again, I'm not, I'll wear a dust mask for that too. I've never had any uh, allergic reaction at all. I do it outdoors as well. Okay, uh, next question. Is your alizarin crimson permanent or, or is it the regular uh, old <laughs> alizarin crimson? So most of you know that alizarin crimson is considered to be a fugitive color, which means it's not, um, it, it gets a lower, it, how should we say this? It's not as light fast as some of the other paints. So if it's exposed to light, it can darken over time. I think alizarin, when you use watercolors, it actually goes the other way. It lightens or fades. I could be wrong about that. Um, but no, I use the real deal because the permanent alizarin, it do, it's, not, it's a different paint. It's a different color. It behaves differently. Um, and I've asked a lot of professional painters that you know I come in contact with if like I'm doing a show with other painters. I've asked people you know, if they use alizarin or permanent, you know, and most of them just use the real deal. Um, you know, because in oil paint, apparently it's fairly stable. I think if your paint is going to be outdoors, or, you know, or, or if it's like in a window where it's getting direct sunlight, that could be a problem. But I have um, color charts that I made almost 20 years ago, and I cannot tell the difference. And they've been indoors, but they've been exposed. Like sometimes they're just kind of on my studio floor. So they haven't been cared for very well. Um, but I have not noticed any change in the alizarin crimson over 20 years. So I think if it, if there is change, it's because it's needs, you know, to be exposed to a lot of light. Um, and, uh, and then over a long period of time. So, yeah. And like I said, most of the painters I talk to use the real deal. All right, let's see here. Would you consider including real time clips of the painting process in your videos? Uh, I've actually done that in the last couple videos. 
um, I had an issue of uh, like an uploading issue here with YouTube for some reason. Uh, and it's probably because my internet's not fast enough. Like any, I had a 45 minute video that was real time, tried to upload it multiple times and it just would get to a certain point and stop uploading and I couldn't get it started again. Uh, so I had to edit it down to about 11 minutes. Um, so I just ordered, I guess like fiber optic, uh, one gig. It's like super fast internet. So I'm going to be able to include longer or I'll start uploading longer videos that include more of the process. So yes, that's something that I will do. You guys let me know in the comments what you like better. If you like the time lapse or if you do like the real time paint application, let me know what you think. All right, what do you use to thin your paint? I know I talk about this a lot in my videos. Mostly, um, if I'm painting on canvas, a lot of times I'll just thin with mineral, mineral spirits and I won't use any medium at all. So in other words, I will, my first pass of blocking in color will just be thinned with mineral spirits and I'll just kind of scrub it in to the canvas. If I'm working on a panel, a lot of times I will use a medium for my scrub in. Um, sometimes not though. Sometimes I'll just use odorless mineral spirits even on a panel. My panels have pumice in the final coat, which gives uh, some absorbency to the panel so that that scrub in, the paint will soak in just a little bit. Um, but the other things, the other two thinners I use um, or mediums I use would be liquid when I'm painting outdoors. And um, I don't use it indoors because it smells really toxic. And then when I'm painting indoors, if I want to use a medium, I'll use a medium that's a mixture of one part odorless mineral spirits, one part stand oil, two parts linseed oil. And, um, and that's a nice way to thin the paint, but keep it, uh, keep the, the, the paint film strong. Because when you thin with odorless mineral spirits, you run the risk of, um, you know, you're thinning out the binder. The binder is the oil in the paint that holds the pigments together. You don't want to compromise that too much. Um, when you're scrubbing into a canvas, it doesn't matter because the color is soaking into the canvas. But if you're working on like a, sh a surface that's not very absorbent, um, you know, you don't want to break that binder down too much because you're not going to get good paint adhe adhesion to that surface. Okay, let's see here. Um, oh, this is random. How do you style your hair? <laughs> hair for me, I just cut it with a number four clipper and I've been doing this myself. Number four clipper, side and back, and then I just kind of hack at the top with scissors. And I like to just keep it short enough so that I don't have to think about it. And I just wake up in the morning, wet my hands. That's it, done. Uh, time to go paint. Uh, that's really it. Uh, sometimes like if I get out of the shower, I'll put a little bit of something in it, either like gel or hairspray, just so that it kind of stands up. So it's not like flat or whatever. Anyway. All right. So how do I dispose of solvents? This is a question I get a lot. People, um, often think that when they're, you know, say they're Gamsol or they're Terpenoid, you know, which is the mineral spirits that you thin your, uh, you can thin your paint with, but you also clean your brushes with. You know, they wonder when that gets dirty, do I just pour it out? Where do I, what do I do? Pour it out or whatever? No, you don't. So what you do is you pour off the dirty mineral spirits into a container. And I'll, I usually pour it into some sort of wide mouth plastic container, like a Gatorade bottle. And then you just let it sit for a couple days and all the pigment will settle to the bottom and it'll be clear again. So you're just constantly reusing it. You, until it runs out because obviously you're using some on your canvas when you're doing your scrub in um, and then some's going to come out in the paper towels when you're cleaning or your rags when you're cleaning your brushes um, so you will run out of it eventually and need obviously need more but you're never taking like dirty mineral spirits and dumping it anywhere you just put it into another container let the sediment settle to the bottom, pour off the clean mineral spirits. And what I do is with the, um, you know, eventually the, the Gatorade container will have a lot of sediment in the bottom. And then I just take it to San Mateo County has a, a hazardous waste disposal. And that's where I also bring all my paper towels and my rags, my empty paint tu tubes. I bring all the paint uh, you know, all that stuff, all the like painting stuff that has paint and thinner and stuff in it, um, and mediums as well. 
Um, and so you may look into that in your in your area. And I also take, I uh, when I go and paint on location too, I have a bag in my backpack, so I bring all of that stuff home with me. Um, I don't like throw it in public garbage cans or anything. I bring it home and bring it all to the hazmat place. Okay, and this looks like the last question here. Uh, how do you have so much paint on your palette? Doesn't it dry up? And yeah, that's a question that I get often. Painting is a messy process. It's, it often surprises me like at the, you know, it's such a messy process and yet at the end it's a, you know, it can be a sort of orderly um, and hopefully beautiful product from the process. Um, but I'm not, you know, I don't spend a lot of time keeping my palette tidy because I'm constantly painting and I'm constantly squeezing out more paint. Um, so let's take a quick look. All right, so as you can see, my palette is covered with paint. Um, you know, just paint splatter and whatnot. This area, the mixing area, has become sort of a mid-tone gray, which is helpful for judging colors. Uh, not colors, well, colors and also values. But anyway, as you can see, there is like dried up paint in the back here, you know, like an underneath the fresh paint. And I just leave that occasionally, like once a month, I'll come and I'll take my palette knife. Uh, when I'm low on paint, I'll take the palette knife and then I'll just kind of scrape up and clean up as best I can and then squeeze out new paint. That is it for these questions. I hope I didn't miss any of your questions. Um, if I did, put them in the comments below. I know it's been a while since I've done a Q&A um, and I'll try to not wait as long to do the next one. So yeah, like I said, put some questions down below if you've got more. Other than that, uh, stay creative and I'll see you guys in the next video.